Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 95. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, the man, the myth. He's pretty much a myth. It's Brandon Turner. In fact, there's actually a thread about Brandon Turner, which is really funny, asking like, how does this guy do all this stuff? Is he real? Is this a real person? Not. But, yeah. I'm fake. This is actually Josh talking to himself. Yes. Yeah. You yes. just have that really, really quick uh, voice change. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. Good job. Sure. Hey, guess what? Yeah. You're going to be really proud. You're going to be really proud of me. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing this. What's all up, right. dude? Here's what happened. So yesterday, I officially handed over my first two properties ever to property management. All right. I know I'm not the Official. only one listening that doesn't believe a word out of his <laughs> mouth. No, I've been what, talking about this for like seven months now. I finally took two of my properties, though the 80-20 rule, the two that give me the most trouble, and I handed them over. And the lady's like, sure, I can take them. No problem. And oh, man. Amazing. So That's awesome. Do you feel like the, the weight of the world off your shoulders? I feel a lot better. Yeah. It's getting uh, better already. Because yeah, That's I awesome. I, these are the two problem properties, so. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, congratulations. That's Thank you. that's great news. And anybody else listening, if you have problem properties and you're tired and you're driving yourself crazy, you might want to consider the same thing. There you go. Yeah. That's, yeah, our, yeah. Quick, that's our quick tip for the day. Th that is uh, a semi-quick quick tip. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. Today's quick tip is uh, success stories. Quick tip. Quick tip. I, ha I had to say it. Go. Yeah, there you go. All right. Today's quick tip. If you're out there doing deals and doing business, Share your success stories. Not enough people are doing this. And I really don't think you guys understand the value of this. The people that I talk to who, who do this, they send me these private messages and they're like, Josh, I got to tell you, sharing success stories was a really good idea because now I have like five more people who want to do business with me. Success breeds success. When people see that you're out there doing business, that you're being successful, they want to be with you. They want to be successful alongside of you. They want to be with you? <laughs> well, whatever man they want to do something but yeah they want to be successful as well so oh, wow, wow. <laughs> sorry go all right keep it clean this is a family show and we have a minister on the show so we do have pastor. a minister today. yeah so that just crossed the line sir <laughs> i'm offended i'm deeply offended i believe you are, you right, are. Guys, yeah, go ahead Move yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> Share your success stories. We have a forum. It's the Bigger Pockets Success Stories Forum. And there's a shortcut to it. It's biggerpockets.com slash success. Go on there, share your success stories, and just let people know, you know, hey, I just closed this deal. Hey, I just found a partnership. Hey, I just did this. And I tell you what, in time, that will prove to uh, help you in your business. So hopefully you'll do it. Yeah, that's today's quick, quick tip. tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brandon, I know you've got a very, very, very fast pro tip. Which yeah, is my pro tip of the week is if you have not yet uploaded a video introduction to your profile, and if you don't even know what that means, it means on your profile, you can put a video introduction of yourself talking and saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm the real deal. And uh, it builds your credibility and builds trust in a way that a you know one inch by one inch photo on the site can never do. So I'm um, seriously, one of the best ways to build credibility is just make a quick one minute video yourself, post it. So uh, if you have any questions on how to do that, go to biggerpockets.com slash profile video. And we're going to do a redirect to the correct page that'll teach you how to do that. So Fabulous. Fabulous. Right on. All right, guys. So today, show 95, we've got a really, really great guest. Uh, we've got a man named Kurt Bidwell. Kurt lives up in next to Podunk. Uh, he lives right <laughs> near uh, Olympia, Washington, I believe, uh, yep. near, near Brandon. And uh, Kurt has been around since 1990 investing in real estate. 
Uh, he's got a really, really cool story for us. He, he's a buy and hold investor. He's done a, a lot of great deals. And to me, the thing that was most exciting is how he got his family involved in the business, how he got his kids yeah. into real estate. It's fascinating and interesting and something I want to emulate. And uh, so definitely some cool stuff. We also get into some high level stuff. We talk about mixed use properties and some commercial real estate. So uh, this is, there's certainly a lot of great stuff for, for the newbies, but there's also a ton of great stuff in here for uh, folks who've been around. So, you know, pay attention, get out your notebook and uh, let's bring them on. All right, Kurt, welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks so much. It was a real privilege to get asked. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kurt and I met, uh, it was at the, what, Washington Landlord Association meetup, right? right. And uh, yeah, you heard me uh, talk for a little while and then you came up and I realized you knew like a thousand times more than I knew and I was the one talking. So you should have been the one up there speaking, but uh, you know, you get your turn today. Nice. Yeah, cool. Well, why don't we start at the very beginning? I mean, how did you get into real estate investing? Oh, wow. Getting involved in real estate was really unintentional. And it's been interesting listening to a lot of the podcasts, realizing a lot of guys got in accidentally or just through a bunch of circumstances. And, and that was me. I was uh, in my mid-20s. I, had, uh, I was a youth pastor. And, oh, really? Uh, interesting. I two of that. my good friends, we had lunch every week. And one was a realtor. The other guy was an army recruiter. And they sat down one day and said, hey, I'm, we're buying a fourplex. You want to join in with us? And I was like, well, I don't have any money. Yeah. I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> and so uh, they, they said, well, that's no problem. We've already put the money down. And uh, so when it makes money, your portion will go back to, to pay your, your share of the down payment. And it's like, well, how do you say no? Yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So uh, we bought the place and a year later we refinanced it and uh, took cash out. So I was able to pay them all back their share. And at that point on, we've been uh, equal. Wow. Wow. I, I'm fascinated by this. I, I have yet to hear somebody uh, use this model. So I've, I've got to find out more. <laughs> why, why do they need you? Why are they asking you? What do you bring to the table? You knew nothing. You're a youth pastor. I mean, maybe you bring the big guy down to make sure that you know, things don't go wrong. But beyond that, you know, what did you bring to the picture and what was their incentive to have you on board? Oh, well, that's a great question. I think you got to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sure you've asked them before once or twice. In reality, I, I had some business sense. Okay, um, I, I was pretty frugal. Yeah, some some people call me cheap, but uh, you know, it's, it's frugal. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I knew how to take care of my own finances. And uh, some of the guys on the team weren't as good as some others. And so, you know, one guy was a realtor. He brought the deals. The other guy brought uh, you know some maintenance and stuff. And and I handled the finances, the money, pretty much. And uh, as we grew together and in the business, I realized I had some other abilities and aptitudes and working with the tenants and the people and that kind of thing. And so uh, it, it was a good relationship. Nice, nice. Nice. And in terms of working off your share, that's a really great idea. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you come in with nothing but, you know, uh, your efforts and yeah. I like that. What, what would you think about that, Brandon? I mean, you do a lot of partnership deals. I mean, how, how would you feel if one of your partners said, hey, you know, you're in 50-50, I'm putting down 85K, you know, you'll get uh, your 50% share when you work the 85K off? <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I mean, in a, in a roundabout way, that's how I've structured a lot of my partnerships in, in that, you know, I don't put in anything and they put in. Uh, but I, I typically don't hear it from a, a newbie standpoint, you know, like getting started uh, without a lot of uh, experience and stuff. So I, I think that's cool. I mean, whatever you can negotiate to get to get it working. And, and it worked, obviously. You guys refinanced yeah, yeah, yeah. it. And- well, the irony is uh, the first guy went broke and we bought his shares out. And yeah. so the two of us have been partners uh, for the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years without him. And now my other partner's getting ready to retire. And so we're working out a buyout plan right now that will probably culminate the end of this year. And so uh, here I am the least ex- experienced and yet I'm the one carrying on and, and moving forward. So nice. that, that's kind of fun. That's yeah. great. So that's great. Yeah. So I, my question is about partnerships. You know, like we talk a lot about that. They're a very popular topic. Uh, so maybe I can just ask you some general questions about your partnership. First of all, I mean, what makes a good partner in your in your mind? I think guys that have a common value system. Uh, if you're not headed the same direction, you're going to struggle. Hmm. And I think the three of us uh, that started together had a lot of that. And uh, with the one partner, you know, we've been together for 24 years oh, wow. and we're still friends. <laughs> and so, <laughs> nice. uh, but there've been some ups and downs you know, we've had moments of disagreements. Uh, 
Uh, but we each play our role and defer to one another, and uh, that's that's been pretty helpful. Yeah, yeah. What the the rocky times? What what usually leads to that? For, at least in your experience, expectations. Okay. You know, one guy comes with a certain set of expectations, and they're not lining up with somebody else's. Yeah. And so, be that financial, be that workload, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, when those things don't congeal together, then there's going to be uh, some issues between you that got to be talked out. Yeah. Is there is there a way to avoid that up front? Well, some of it, I suppose. I mean, a, a good partnership agreement helps to define what those responsibilities are. But as you move forward, you find, uh, at least in our case, because we, we started out together as really rank amateurs and uh, not really knowing like they say, we didn't know what we didn't know. Right. And, and so we grew together with some of those things. And as that developed, I don't know that a partnership agreement would have resolved everything, but certainly it, it does define what your specific roles are. And that's important. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, so do you do all your deals with this partner or do you do anything on your own? Uh, the greatest majority of my properties are in this partnership. Okay. I have two other partnerships and then I do have some of my own property. Okay. The other, the other partnerships are pretty minor. Okay. So can we go back a little bit? And, and I think we definitely want to get back to partnerships again. But what kind of properties have you invested in? Uh, just about everything. We started with a fourplex. We sold that, moved up to a sixplex, which was three duplexes on one parcel. We added two more duplexes. And then we sold those out and bought new construction down in our own area. So we have single family homes, we have duplexes, we have some uh, town homes, basically duplexes, but they're separate parcels on each side. We bought uh, several of those when the market was really skyrocketing in 2003, 2004. And after accumulating some of those, we sold off a portion of those in order to buy mixed use property uh, out in Shelton, which is 38 apartments. And then it has some retail uh, office on the first floor and a restaurant space. Nice. We, we kept that for a year, two years, refinanced it, took cash out of that and bought 24 units, all two bedroom, one bath units. And wow. so, uh, so a little bit of everything, a little yeah. bit of commercial, not so much that, mostly residential, single what? family as well as apartments. And was there a plan? Was, was there, Hey, we're going to, you know, catapult one to the next, the next, the next, or, or, you know, was it, Hey, let's just find the next deal, figure out if it looks good regardless of what it is and kind of go from there. I mean, you didn't have a, Hey, we want to step up, step up, step up plan or did you? Originally, no. Uh, I mean, when I say we started as rank amateurs, I really did. Yeah. Uh, The realtor we were working with, a great guy, I love him uh, still today. They moved off to some warm place down in Florida, uh, (laughs) the opposite side of the world from us, but uh, didn't get a lot of education from him or from from a real estate. I learned about landlord. He didn't learn about real estate. And so I got to a point where I was looking at my own self saying, okay, if I was to retire today on today's dollars, what would I need? Okay. I had half of 10 units. So I had five units. What else did I need? And I decided, well, if I had two more duplexes, I, we'd be all right. And so I went looking for them. Gotcha. And uh, I found a gal who had some incredible expertise in real estate, in marketing. She had experience as a landlord. Her husband was a builder. And so she had all these dynamics coming together. And when we sat down and talked with her, we began to realize there's a bigger picture here and we're yeah. really missing out. Yeah. So, so your initial goal, it seems then, was to aim for retirement. I mean, you were getting yeah. into re- real estate with the purpose of going for retirement. Exactly. Okay. A- a- as a pastor, I had opted out of Social Security. Okay. And so I didn't have that to fall back on other than my non-ministerial activities. And so that's pretty minimal. So I'm looking for other ways to say, okay, how can I care for my, my family uh, down the road? Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And I, and I think that's important too, because I mean, nobody knows what it's going to be like, but there's a good possibility we won't have social security when I'm, you know, that <laughs> age either. Like a lot of people our age might not have it either. So I, I think that's a good way for everyone to look at it today. I mean, if it's there, it'll be icing mm-hmm. on the cake someday. Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of take the assumption that I will never get social security because it'll <laughs> yeah. be bankrupt before then. And, you know, maybe they'll fix it, but I don't know. So anyway, I think that's, that's a cool way of looking at it. Uh, so I, I want to ask just so people have an idea. Shelton, you mentioned Shelton. That's where you live. Now, I know where that is, obviously, because I'm yeah. from out here. But for those people um, who don't. That's in the middle of nowhere, I'm guessing. I'm, yeah. Well, know, here's the deal. Is that Shelton, Podunk, Washington? Is that what that is? No, that's where Brandon's from. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, but it's right next door. Okay. Yes. Next to I live Podunk. In a, 
I, I live in Olympia. That's the state capital. Okay. Shelton's 20 minutes from me, right off of I-5. I-5 hits from Vancouver, Canada to Mexico. Yep. And when we were trying to refinance this thing last year, I had banks literally tell me, it's too far off of I-5. And I said, well, it's 20 minutes. And they would say, yeah, but it's a long 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's exactly how I think about Shelton. I'm like, it's only a half hour yeah. drive from my house, but it's a long yeah. half hour drive. There you go. Interesting. House. Interesting. Well, the reason I well the reason I bring that up is because I like I guess I want to know like pricing in that area because again, Olympia is very very expensive um, compared at least to Grace Harbor. Uh, maybe not yeah. compared to a lot of places, but you know, how does Shelton compare with Olympia, more of a busy, uh, more expensive area? Well, yeah, definitely, it, it's a, a smaller market. I mean. The town of Shelton is probably eight or nine thousand people proper. Um, you got over a hundred thousand in Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater. So um, it's a bedroom community. It's a retirement community. A lot of low income. It was hit big with the timber industry years ago when that went in major decline. So yeah, it doesn't have the draw, the attraction out there. But uh, this being a commercial property still has has some value, and we've been able to increase value in it. Okay. Nice. Okay. Nice. So, so you started with multis. I mean, you you just hopped right in. Obviously, you know, there's a whole story behind it, as we discussed, and really kind of went from there. It sounds like you didn't really ever go back to single family. It sounds like you pretty much stayed with the multis, unless I'm getting it wrong. Yeah, when we made the transition from our original properties uh, up in the Tacoma area, that Brandon would be familiar with. When we bought our new construction, we had a mix of single family and duplexes. Okay. And then, see, that's 2003, 2004. Literally within nine months of buying some of those, we were refinancing because okay. the market was growing so fast. And so we took money out, bought more duplexes and single families. With By 2006, we sold about half a dozen or more of those and bought the multifamily. But your purpose has always been cash flow, right? I mean, you're, you're buying this for cash flow. You're not flipping houses. You're not wholesaling. You're, you're doing buy and hold, correct? By and large, yes. Okay. I, I've always had the mentality. I wanted to do some flipping, but I buy something and then I fix it and I keep it and I rent it. And, nice. and you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And of, so of, of the different asset classes, the multis, the new construction, the townhomes, the mixed use, which has been your favorite and why? Oh, for different reasons. I, I got a little house that's just been a, a real fun house. I'd love to tell you about that in a minute. Uh, my preference is to have the multifamilies, larger multifamilies. Okay. Uh, and if I could trade all my smallers into larger ones, I would probably do that. The reason being is it's it's consolidated. Um, I, I have more control over the value as I control the rents and expenses, and uh, for management purposes and so forth. I think uh, I, I would like to see, and, and this has been changing even in the last few months. I've been doing some reading, and even on the. Uh, on the forums, uh, getting some input. You know, I, I had this mentality, I need a 150, 200 unit complex. And as I've done a little reading, I'm thinking, okay, maybe more in the 50 to 75 units, two or three or four of those yeah. instead yeah. of one single. And so, uh, you know, I'm still developing and growing in my thinking about uh, where I want to be. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm, I'm curious. I, I want to hear about that, that single family, but I'm going to ask you a couple more houses. So somebody hold on to that thought. Um, First, do you have in-house management, I'm assuming, on the big multis? Uh, only on the Shelton unit because it's out there and the design of that property is kind of like a dorm. Okay. It's all interior um, studio and one-bedroom units. And so we do have a live-in uh, manager there who takes care of just everything. She does a fantastic job out there. Okay. I did have management on the 24 unit when I was working full-time. Yeah. And... Uh, Problem was I had five empty units and uh -huh. wasn't getting them filled. And so when I left my position, we let her go. And uh, now I usually only have one or two empty and things are running a lot smoother. So gotcha. how many do you have right now, total units then? Uh, about 85. Okay. okay. So uh, 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 go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Well, this, oh, at no. some point of the show, I want to talk about how you do that. Because I mean, I have, you know, half that <laughs> and I go crazy. With, like my wife works full time and I go crazy with the, with the, so I want to know how you do that. And we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit, but Josh, did you have something or? I, well, you know, he had mentioned going with the three smaller, well, you know, 60, 80, whatever uh, units versus, you know, a 300 unit. Why, why would that be an approach that would be preferable? I'm, I'm just curious, you know, wh what were people on the forum saying and, and. You know, I guess for the listeners, why does that make sense for you? Well, later on, you're going to ask about books, and one of those is Marketopoly. <laughs> and no, 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 no. Uh, uh, it, 
he had some interesting ideas about some of that and uh, some of the other reading, just uh, liquidity of a smaller complex versus a really big one okay. is one big issue, and then just diversification. Okay. Okay. So primarily those two things. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Brandon, I know you had a... Yeah. So I, I just am curious. I mean, like, do you have any... I mean, how do you do it? What do you do? Do you still show units yourself? Are you doing repairs yourself? What all do you do and what don't you do? I do everything I like to do. Okay. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> That's answer. What, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, I do most everything. You got to understand that with our houses and townhomes, those are mostly new and like new. Yeah. So I have very little maintenance. I have a higher uh, quality tenant. I got professional people, state office workers, so forth. And so I, I don't have to babysit those. Uh, I get a call occasionally uh, when somebody moves. Obviously, you're going to do some turnover. And so um, that's not a big deal. Uh, the apartments, I've got a little lower uh, class clientele. I do have Section 8. We put about 30% Section 8 in those. Uh, I have a couple of other situations, community use services that we've given a couple units to and some of that kind of subsidy. But, uh, you know, it, it, some of it's mentality, it's uh, tolerance, it's ability and interest and in how I interact with people. And uh, by and large, I don't find it a big burden. That's nice. nice. Yeah, I, I, and I think... I think a lot of it is I feel like most of mine are like your Shelton property, probably, you know, like they're all one bedroom yeah. studios. Like I got some <laughs> yeah. two bedrooms in there, yeah. you know, they're, they're very management intensive. So I, de- yeah, yeah. Josh play the violin. <laughs> so I like, Oh, I like what you did, right? Like you, you, as you like grew, at least it sounds like you got higher quality. I mean, I don't know what your original fourplex was like, but it sounds like you diversified into some nice, nice. No, we were, we, we were, uh, we were having drug busts and all that. Okay. Out there. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> so, always fun. So you, as well, yeah. I, I tell people, I, I've seen, I think I've seen almost everything and then next week something else happens, but yeah. you know, I've got the hoarders that should be on TV. We've had drug <laughs> addicts. Yeah. We've had prostitutes. We've had gun running, meth labs, suicide attempts. I've Way had to go, people... pastor. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We, we try to work with them, you know. <laughs> best and brightest tenants, don't you? Yeah, we, we work with them all, you know. But, yeah. you know, sometimes we have bad days, too. And so... Because <laughs> <laughs> a prostitute is kind of a bad day. No, no. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay. So, so you, you, okay. So you are at least getting higher quality just to bring us back in. You're getting, I mean, as you grow throughout your investing kind of career, and I like the the fact that earlier you said you're still developing, you're still growing. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, I love that. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like I don't hear that. Like we hear it on bigger pockets, but so many people in the world that like, they have this, like, I'm, I've reached it. You're right. Like I'm there uh, mentality, yeah. especially oh. with guys who are teaching and talking like, you know, I've made it. Well, I, uh, yeah, I was surprised when you called me. I mean, I'm not a professional. <laughs> well, I guess I am technically, but I, I'm not a realtor. Never have been. Never thought I wanted to be. Still not sure I would want to be, but uh, I've just done it. It's been a part of my life and, and developed a, a love. Yeah. Well, according cool. to the IRS, you probably are a professional, right? I put more than the whatever it is, 700 hours. So yeah, I could probably claim it. <laughs> so you are definitely a professional. You are indeed. Well, yeah, that, that's good. And, and, you know, one of the things for us is this, you know, for those of you guys who are listening, I, I don't think we've ever actually talked about our philosophy. And I know it's kind of kind of cut out a little bit of your time, but I'll do it really quickly on who we want to bring on to the show. We want to bring it. We don't want to bring on some guy that everybody looks up and is like, oh, OK, I can't even imagine getting to that point. You know, we want to bring on, uh, we want to talk to somebody who just did their first deal to, to somebody like you who's got 80 units, to somebody who's got hundreds or thousands. And our, our goal is to really help people understand how they built their business, how they grew. And I don't think there's been a show, you, you know, you, you can tell me if there has been, where, where I haven't learned something where you, you know, there's always a takeaway no matter how experienced you right. are. And, and that's what we try to do. We, we, we think anybody and everybody we want to talk to can, can share something that anybody and everybody can learn from. And frankly, if you were the guy who said, I know everything, there's not a chance in hell I'm going to bring you on my show. <laughs> we don't want to interview yeah. you if, you're doing, if, that, if that's your mindset because you know, we want people who don't think they know it all because I don't think anybody does. Right. So anyway... Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's hop back to to partners. You know, we we talked about what makes a good partner. Why why partner? I mean, at this point, it seems that you're probably fairly successful. You've you've probably done pretty well for yourself uh, in the real estate world. Why do you continue to bring on partners versus going at it alone? 
That's a great question because I was asked that this morning. I actually had a had had coffee with a, a BP guy from nice. up in Seattle. Came he told down me to and, ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me if I'd partner with him, and 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 I smiled at him and I said no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm at a stage where I'm moving out of partnerships because yeah. I'm at a point where I don't need them, and uh, maybe it's because I'm too controlling and whatnot. And you know, that part of part of the reason a partnership works is because one guy can say this is the way it's going to be, and everybody else says, "Yeah, okay." Yeah. Uh, and I was kind of that guy. Nice. So, yeah, I, I am. I'm phasing out of partnerships at this point, and I, I have a partnership with my son. I have a partnership with another really good friend, and that's it. Other than this major one that we're going to be buying out of uh, probably by the end of this year. Nice, yes. nice. Uh, so I'm I'm going to interrupt the whole flow that we had here because you mentioned your son, mm-hmm. and. I have been told that you've got a 15-year-old, and I've also been told that not only do you have a 15-year-old, but you have a 15-year-old who's actually done a real estate deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we, we got to hear about that. Well, he's not 15 anymore, but that just means the story has developed and, and gotten better. Wow. I, I told both of my boys when they were young, I said, uh, you know, they'd watched us grow up with these properties, and they've seen some of the benefit, and so uh, they want to buy property, you know, the kids want to imitate the parents, and so... I said, when you get the money for closing costs, we'll go look for a deal. And so uh, both of my boys ran businesses. One had a bounce house that he rented uh, to parties and events. And the other. How old was he when he had a bounce house business? Oh, I think he was probably 12 when he started. (laughs) Wow. Uh, He he did that until he went away to college and we sold it. And, you know, he went on to other things. But uh, he's now studying to be a doctor. But. my younger boy, he started mowing lawns when he was about nine. He had a lady in the church that'd give him seven bucks and a candy bar, and uh, <laughs> nice. and that was his start. And we went down to you know the big box store, and he bought a lawn mower on ninety days, same as cash, and uh, had it paid off in two months, and and uh, mowed for the neighbors and wherever he could. He got a a contract with one of the developments that we had to do the homeowners association. Wow. They found out he was only I think maybe eleven at the time, and they fired him. <laughs> And uh, so he was That's kind age of, uh, discrimination. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but we learned some stuff about contracting. We learned that a kid uh, under 18 can't sign a contract unless he owns a partnership or a business or corporation. Oh, interesting. And so as they got a little older, he uh, saved up his money and uh, he had all his closing costs down. Guy that used to do my computer work, they were selling their house. His wife had gotten an inheritance. They paid off that house and put money down on another one. And, but the house needed some work, and they weren't suited to do the work, trust me. And uh, he was good with computers not other things in life. Nice. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, I said, well, you know, have you thought about carrying a contract? And they just kind of stared at me and said, what's that mean? And I said, well, you become the bank. And they said, well, we don't have any money. I said, no, your house is the money. Yeah. And so uh, I just took out, you know, the the yellow pad and started writing away. I said, well, here, here's a possibility. Here's your value and here's an interest rate and here's what we'd pay you. And, you know, in three years we refinance it or sell it and you get all your money. And we came back again a couple of days later and kind of spelled it out more specifically. And they said, yeah, we, we'd like to do that. So uh, we had this two-bedroom, one-bath bungalow, 720 square feet. And uh, we agreed on $150,000 for it. And uh, we moved in the week before closing and started renovating, tearing out the ugly carpets and painting the pink walls and everything. And uh, we stuck it on Craigslist and I got slammed with calls. We had the thing rented in a day. Wow. And so it, this was a 1925 home that had been put on this lot in the 1950s. And they put it on, an, on a, a full basement that had its own entrance from the back. Are you saying they actually physically moved this 1920s home onto the exactly. lot where there was a basement already existing? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And so as we're walking away from the home for the first time, my son looks at me and he says, Dad, look look over there. I says, yeah, what about it? See that door? That's another unit. Wow. Nice. This is at fi- and this was at 15. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sharp kid. And so uh, we spent the next year uh, working on the basement together. Uh, we had a framer come in and framed it out for us. And then uh, we strung wires and plumbing and all the different things in there. And we got it ready. And uh, we got the basement rented out in addition to the upstairs as two separate units. Kind of nice. unofficial. 
uh, now we've got two people that are related to each other in there. It's working out great. And uh, so over the years, uh, three years went by, we got into the downturn of the, the economy. We were supposed to pay them off. I sat down with them and I said, well, you see what the market's doing. It's, it's not worth what we even paid for it. Um, you know, you can take it back or you can extend the note. Well, they, they didn't want to take it back. Yeah. I said, yeah, we'll, we'll extend the note. And I said, I really want to go out five years this time. And, uh, but we're going to, instead of paying you interest only, we'll, we'll pay you a full amortized payment. So we went from like 500 to 750. They were excited about that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately for them, a year later, they, they split. Oh. And so now they want their money so that they can go their separate ways. And so I said, well, you know, we still don't have the value in it. And uh, I'm talking to brokers, mortgage brokers and so forth, and we can get about 120 for it. So if you want to apply all the payments that we've made to you towards principal, basically do a discounted payment, we can get you 120. And they jumped all over it. They were excited. It worked great for them. So uh, this time Riley got it financed in his own name and because uh, he was old enough at this point. And uh, he got 30 years at 3.75. His full principal interest tax insurance payment was less than we were paying before hmm. with just, just the mortgage payment. And so uh, with the income that's come off of that, we put a new roof on it. Just this week, we finished reciting it. Next summer, we plan to put a garage on it. And, uh, you know, it's gone up to about 185000 190000 value today. Wow. And, uh, so it's, it's been a very fun house. Yeah. So, so how, do you, uh, how do you do that? I mean, not the house part, but how do you get your kids to be financially wise? How, how do, you know, I, I've got a couple little girls and, and – I definitely want to train them to be entrepreneurs as well, and yeah. um, I, you know, I, I'm sure there's lots of people listening who who are in, in the same place. So, what what did you do? How did how'd you get your kid mowing lawns? How'd you get your kid, you know, doing all this, you know, bounce house business and everything else? Well, our our home has been a home of entrepreneurs. My wife is in direct sales and does very well with that, and so they've grown up seeing us with the properties. They've seen her busy with her stuff and. You know, my activities in the church and so forth. And so they've grown up watching these things take place. We talk about money in our home. Uh, yeah. I, never, I never hid things from them. They knew how much our mortgage payment was. They knew how much money I brought home. It was never a secret. As they got older and Rich Dad came out with his stuff, I got them Rich Dad for teens and made them endure that. And, uh, you know, they learned from that. And uh, they, they developed uh, a desire and a mentality that said we can do something. We never told our kids no unless we really meant it. Yeah, yeah. And so if they said, hey, can I go do this? Well, yeah, you can. Yeah. But there might be some costs and consequences. So consider this. And so, you know, when they're paving the street out front, they ran out there with the, uh, the lemonade stand with hot dogs and chips. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Know? Smart. And so uh, it just kind of grew for them. And yeah. uh, being open about what they could do and giving them permission to do things that weren't necessarily standard. Yeah, but uh, didn't have a reason to say no. Yeah, when I'm driving them around mowing lawns or taking them to do a a bounce house rental, I made them do the interaction with the the client, mm. and uh, that helped them grow and mature and get experience in those areas in a in a you know a controlled environment, and so they grow up with some confidence that way. That's awesome. That really is amazing. And and you know I. I know I came from a family of entrepreneurs and my family came from a family of, entre yeah. you know, and it, it's kind yeah. of, you know, brought itself down. I wonder how much of a challenge it is for somebody who was not raised in, in such an environment. And so I, I think a lot of the feedback that you gave just now was, was really, really you know, priceless in, in terms of what you can do. I guess for, for anyone listening who may not have the entrepreneurial background, do you have any other tips that you think might be helpful? Oh, I, I think, uh, Developing relationships with your kids, you know, outside of even the home in, in that business environment really helped a lot. When I'm driving my kids to, to their activities, we're talking about how it's going to work and we're talking about other things about life. And so, you know, my kids, uh, I, I can brag about them. They never really rebelled in, in the classical sense. And I think because it was those interactions and giving them a purpose, I, I would say graciously that I thought one of my boys was either going to be a great success or in jail. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> because he was so aggressive and he was, you know, we had to stay ahead of that and, and we had to give him purpose and direction and creating a positive direction for him where he benefited from it 
as well as benefiting other people in the process, I think really helped him. That's fantastic. That's really, really great. Look, I, what age do you think is appropriate to start, you know, that I mean, is it from the time they're a baby? I mean, like, uh, would you wait till they're 10? I mean, where, where do you begin that process? Well, my youngest son, both my boys played t-ball. And, you know, they had to sell candy bars. And everybody hates selling candy bars. But uh, there was a bike to be earned. And so my younger boy, he walks up to the lady and he says, now that bike that we're going to win if we sell 10 boxes, is it a new bike? <laughs> It was an eight. It was an eight. I, I, I was a youth pastor. I didn't have big income. We shopped at the garage sales and whatever, you know. Yeah. And so uh, he saw that new bike and he had a he had a goal. And my boys never saw obstacles. They just saw the goals. And the obstacles, you just work your way through them and you get to the goal. And so he stood out in front of Safeway for eight hours at a stretch. Oh. And when my wife would say, "Are you tired?" He'd say, "How many boxes are left?" Nice. nice. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, giving them goals, giving yeah. them purpose, something that they're going to benefit and win with. Yeah. And I, you, you know what? I think that applies to adults as well. You know, a Absolutely. lot of a lot of people find that they they have a hard time motivating themselves. They have a hard time getting themselves work. You know, people look at me. I, you know, in the past ten years, I've worked more than most people uh, would would dare to say they've worked. <laughs> probably, probably more. How many now. days off have you had now, Josh? In the last in, eight years. In the last eight years, I've taken a single day off. One day off. I've okay. worked every Shame on you. Shame every on other you. day. Yep. With the birth of my kids. You name it. Well, I have a goal. Though. <laughs> you know, and for me. You know, yes, I need I need a little bit a little bit of time off. But you'll like, find out how much more efficient you are when oh, you come yeah. back refreshed. I'm, I, I no, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. But I mean, I you know, for me, I love I love I love what I'm doing, and I have yeah. a goal, and my goal is getting closer and closer and closer. And for me, it's like I I'm the I'm that personality type. I can't stop yeah. until I get there. And and you know, my brain is always going. I'm always yeah. thinking. And so you know, I. I've been thinking about it. I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to go take a week off and go somewhere. And then I was talking to somebody last night and I was like, wait a second. I'm going to thaw, quote unquote, thaw. <laughs> the entire time I'm thawing, my brain is just going to be going. The clearer I get from this thaw, the more I'm going to be thinking about the goal. And so even when I'm off, I'm never off. I can't shut it off. And And I think most entrepreneurs, and I think the same applies to real estate investors. You know, you go take a day off. It's not a day off. You're, you're still thinking about your portfolio or, you know, you, you're on vacation and you look at a condo. Oh, that might be a good <laughs> rental. Let's go, let's oh, go yeah. Airbnb that sucker. <laughs> I mean, you're not, come on, come on. Oh yeah. We, we look at properties all over the, the world, wherever we go. And uh, we always dream and imagine what if we own this? What if we own that? How much would it take to do that? And yeah. it, it's a fun pastime, but right. uh Yeah. But the, anyway, bottom line is the motivations, it's either in you or it's, or it's not. And if it's not, then you got to find a way to build it. And, you know, right. creating a goal, you know, whether you've got the job and saying, hey, I want to be able to get out of my job, that's your goal. Or I want to make X amount of dollars or X a month, you know, whatever it is. If you're listening to the show and you don't have the motivation, create that goal, figure out what it is, it, maybe make it, you know, easy or, you know, attainable at first so that you're not you know, uh, disappointed. And, and then once mm -hmm. you see that you can do that, uh, you kind of extend it and extend it. And we, we do this all the time at bigger pockets, Brandon and I, it's funny. I mean, the goals that we have are, are ridiculous. You know, sometimes we <laughs> set our goals so high that when we actually make, uh, achieve those goals, you know, we look at it, we're like, Oh man, that was kind of disappointing. Yeah. I'd be really, <laughs> you know, why, why didn't we triple that? Yeah. Why didn't we set a higher goal? And, and so, um, but creating those wins for you and the staff and whoever, that motivates you forward. Absolutely. And, and, and you gotta you gotta get a few wins under your belt and experience Absolutely. that to to excel. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, so that's great about your son. It's fascinating and, and hopefully everybody listening also thinks it is. I, I think, you know, getting your kids and, and really training them to become financially smart uh, beyond just real estate too um, is is really important. Um, I, I was a teacher for four years and one of the things that I did outside of my curriculum was financial education to the kids. I, I thought it was extremely important. I realized that when I had gotten to college and into the real world, I didn't have any. And, right. and I had to teach it to myself. And so uh, we, we really uh, do need to work harder to do that stuff uh, for, for our children, I think. Um, I, I'd like you to jump back. You talked about this fun story on the single family house. Can, can you uh, dig in on that a little bit? 
What more do you want to know? Well, you oh, said that, it was fun. Oh, was, was that the same the story? Your son? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh. oh we yeah. covered it and I didn't even know well, it. Well, 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 that the was beauty, fun. The, the beauty of that is it's growing and appreciating, so he's now looking at getting a HELOC on it so he can go get another one. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Hey, for those people who don't know what that is, because I'm a big fan of those, <laughs> what is a HELOC? That's a home equity line of credit, and some places will do them on non-owner. Yeah, and, and what does that mean? I mean, like for somebody who wants to use one, why, why is that helpful? Why would we want to do that? It's cash in your pocket ready for another down payment. Well, how does it work exactly? So you've got a property, explain the property. Yeah, okay, so you go to the bank and you say, I want to get, it's basically a second, but it's a line of credit. So uh, it's money that you can take as you need it. You can pay it back, take it again, t- pay it back. And you might have 10-year draw period where you can use that money back and forth and then uh, usually maybe a 10-year payback period after that. And during that draw period, you're only required to make uh, interest-only payments. Uh, in our case, we try to pay it back as quick as we can so we've got that money available to go put into something else. But it gives you flexibility as opposed to a straight second where you're amortized over uh, a set number of years. Do those interest rates look similar to uh, uh, conforming rates on mortgage? Uh, pretty close. They're going to be typically a little bit higher. I've had my... Uh, line of credit for about six or seven years. I'm running about 5%. Okay. okay. And I've seen some a little lower currently, four and a quarter-ish. Yeah. Nice. I, nice. I know a friend of mine has a uh, a line of credit that, I mean, but instead of a home equity line of credit, like on one property, what he did is he went to the bank and said, I've got these, you know, eight properties, each one with a pretty significant chunk of equity. Uh, can mm-hmm. we just do one big? And he got, I think it was $550,000 line of credit from the bank. And, wow. Nice. And they were just like, doing a ton of stuff. I mean, new construction, they could finance anything they wanted to. Oh, I mean, yeah. out in Grace Harbor, that goes a long way, right? Like <laughs> you can buy half the town. And so, yeah, they were doing a lot of stuff. And I think they still have it. I don't know, you know, if the banks that were, you know, are still as generous, but you know, he just, he had the equity in a, a lot of different properties. So he just combined yeah. them together and got a blanket, a blanket line of credit. I, I'm trying to temper my, my son right now. Cause they do temp- typically tend to value the homes a little more conservatively on those. And so you say, well, it's worth 180000 They're going to say, yeah, but we think you're worth 170 yeah. So they're not necessarily going to give you everything that's there. Yeah. Gotcha. And the, the danger of those, I mean, in, a, in its very basic sense, it's almost like a gigantic credit card that exactly. if you don't pay it, you lose a property. And so they're, they are very dangerous things. And I, mm-hmm. But I, I think the key is like what you guys are doing is you're buying further assets with that, with that liability, mm-hmm. essentially. So it kind of like cancels right. out the evil of it and makes it better, hopefully. Um, well, and you got to calculate the total cost of capital in that so that those costs are included in whatever you're going to receive from your new property. Yeah. You know, my in-laws recently, um, a couple of years ago, they bought a, there was a duplex they wanted to buy and they own their house free and clear. Duplex came up on the market and they wanted it. But uh, the way that they worked it, ended up doing it is they went to the bank, got a home equity line of credit on their own home, not on the on the rental house, and then went out right. and bought the duplex with just that money. So they did they, they the entire deal with no money down. Cause you know, if they would have gone, the, gone and got a mortgage on that property, they would have been required to put down 20, 25%. Right. But when they use their own property, the equity to cover it, they did the entire deal, nothing out of pocket whatsoever. And uh, now they can go and refinance that property if they want to pull out the cash and do it again and again and again. It's just, it's a very cool strategy of, uh, yeah. of getting in there creatively. So nice. very cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about, uh, Let's talk about creative investing. We've been talking a lot about that lately. You know, with my new book that came out, we've been talking, you know, it's kind of been a big... Oh, man. Yeah, I got to so, play. You, do you see how I... Shameless, I, 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 do you see how shameless. I slid that in there? Biggerpockets.com slash no money. Check no, it out. That, that shameless, was shameless. Shameless. <laughs> By the way, this is show 95 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 95. Thank you. All right, nice. All right, so I guess I want to know uh, creative creative finance. Is there anything in that in your career? I mean, we talked about the very first deal that you didn't have any money. Have you ever done anything like that since? Or do you have any other like creative techniques that you've used ever to buy real estate? Well, most of them have been, you know, standard bank financing. But like what you just talked about, when the market was moving up, we were refinancing homes, taking seconds, taking cash out, uh, lines of credit out of existing properties in order to, to buy additional properties. So we've done a number of those. Uh, we've done a couple of the... Uh, uh, owner finance ones. Uh, we've done it where we'll get a owner to carry back a portion when we bought uh, the 24 unit. The owner carried back 100 grand, and uh, so uh, standard bank commercial financing, but with an owner carry back on that, so that uh, that minimized how much we had to come out of pocket. Okay. Uh, how, how much did you have to come out of pocket, and how much was the property? 
Uh, the 24 unit was just over two million. Okay. And uh, so seems like we were bringing around 400 some thousand plus the carry back, and that was pulled out of the other commercial. Yeah. When we refied that. So what it, they carried a hundred, so it was four hundred plus plus the five, the hundred for five. So you still, I mean, you still had to put money down. They weren't yeah. financing the property right. for you. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a pretty common strategy, isn't it, on commercial property? Is getting some kind of cash back at least from the uh, from the seller? I think so. That is pretty typical, and you know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of money, and and either you don't have it or you've got it tied up. So if if a commercial guy is not willing to to pitch in and help out, it's going to make making a deal a little tougher. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense. So uh, you went from one property to the next, and you, you kind of were I, I forget what 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 it's called. My brain is a little fried here, but getting getting rid of one property, picking up the next one. You know, sizing <laughs> up. I know there's a word and it's escaping me, but that's okay. Were you uh, doing a 1031 on on these properties? Were you exchanging them? Most of the time, okay. Uh, not always. We would kind of balance out what the advantage was to have a higher uh, basis, or if it was better to just transfer the property on up. And if it didn't affect us tax wise, we would take the hit right then. And uh, but you need an accountant at that point to decide uh, how much of this should be pushed forward because you're you're building massive equity when you do that, and your basis goes all the way back to those first properties. Yeah. And so. Uh, uh, we tried to balance whether or not there was a tax advantage or how heavy the hit was in a given year. Okay. Uh, so in other words, case. yeah, talk to a talk to a CPA if you're going to do that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Nice. Can you can you idea. explain really quickly what is a, a 1031 for those people who may not know? Uh, 1031 is a tax deferred exchange where you're taking income property and exchanging it for income property. It's like kind exchange, and so uh, there's a lot of rules that regulate that. I think you have to have more debt when you finish than you had in the beginning and so forth. Uh, there's some, some rules about all of that kind of thing, but uh, that you, you can carry your, your basis and your property forward so that basically you're never paying capital gains uh, until the day you die and pass it on to your heirs and keep rolling. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> There you go, kids. Here's a big fat tax bill. <laughs> well, I know there are ways to like, even at that point, I, I like, I don't know what they are, but I know there's ways to, to, to move that money that, you know, the rules that the rich people know that we have, you know, we're still learning. So I know, uh, yes. I know Amanda Hahn mentioned that back forever ago when she was on the podcast and she's a CPA. So, uh, cool. Um, well, I want to talk about the mixed use property. Uh, because yeah. yeah, we, I mean, I don't think we've had anybody on the nope. show that like we've talked about the mixed use. So uh, I think it's been talked about in passing, but yeah, but never, never like a detail. Yes. Yeah. So let's dive into that. I mean, first of all, what does that mean? Mixed use? Uh, basically it means that the property has multiple primary uses. So in our case, we have residential use and we have commercial use. We have retail office and restaurant uh, together with the uh, residential upstairs. So, uh, we've got a mix of of purposes. And what's attractive about that? Well, I that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, you know, I, I think they're cool. I would I would love to have uh, you know some mixed use property. I, I I just think they're cool. But like you know, outside when, when of the, that, when the market tanks and businesses hurt, then the mixed use can hurt. Yeah. Uh, now we've got some smaller offices, five hundred square feet. We've got uh, nail salon and hair salon, and those are like seven eight hundred square feet. And I, I can get those read at almost any time, you know, as needed. But when you get bigger, uh, the restaurant's over 3,500 square feet, probably the biggest restaurant space in Shelton, I'm thinking. And uh, we've been empty for a while, yeah. a long while. And uh, people are intimidated by it. We'll make them a great deal. Uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, we, we've looked at a lot of options. The city limits some of what we can do. And so uh, larger commercial uh you know, requires somebody who can come in and, and support it with their business. Yeah. And so uh, that's a liability in some cases. So, so that's definitely a, a challenge. Are there any other challenges that kind of come along with mixed use? Oh, making sure that your uses complement one another. Uh, the restaurant that we had initially, they wanted to build out a lounge and we had to put some limits on them time-wise, and they wanted to have some live music, but uh, we've got residents right above them. And so yeah. we said, you know, it's got to be acoustic. It can't be after whatever time in the evening. And so some different things so that the one use doesn't uh, yeah. detract from the other. So you don't want like a machine shop 
underneath yeah. your apartment. There you go. Yeah. Uh, nice. Say, so how do you how do you advertise a rental in a commercial space like that? Like, if I if how are you looking for tenants to take those, whether it's the the, the small ones or the big ones, for the commercial side? Yeah. Um, Craigslist, like everybody else, okay. uh, uh, put a sign in the front window, uh, for the restaurant. I have a, a realtor working with us as well. And so, yeah, every way we can. Okay. So it do sounds you, pretty do standard. You, do you, now, do you find in terms of renting out the apartments that there's anything different about, uh, renting out a mixed use apartment in a mixed use complex versus a, uh, a house or, a, just a regular apartment building? Uh, not really. It, it's subject to that property and the, the needs and interest of people. And so we're downtown. We're in the core of this, of the town. Yeah. Uh, we're on the corner of highway three and railroad, which is the two main roads in town. Nice. Uh, we are studio in one bedroom. So we have a little bit more of a, uh, transient population. They'll come in for a year or six months and then move on or, but we've got a pretty good arrangement in there with our management. So, people have a sense that they're at home there. So yeah. uh, we've developed a, a living room space, a common area. And so they can come down and watch ball games together or they can have a pizza feed or nice. they, cool. they, they get together and do holiday dinners and that kind of thing. Or we've got a little park area in the back. So they'll do barbecues in the summer. And Oh, nice. So that's, oh, cool. that's great. Yeah. I was going yeah. to say, it's cool to kind of develop that community. Like, do you feel like you did that? on purpose or did that just kind of happen because of the manager you have in there? I think it happened because of the manager, but if I was to do it again, I'd be looking for that kind of manager. Yeah. I'm just so thinking, you, yeah. Go, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm I, just thinking I, I, I got my, you know, sorry, 20, you know, my 24 unit. I'm like, man, the, the, I never see the tenants do things together, but if I could like cultivate that sort of, and I remember when I bought the place, I used to think, oh yeah, we should have like 4th of July parties outside. And then I realized <laughs> I don't want to be in that area on the 4th of July, you know, like, <laughs> like I, I want to go hang out with my family. We're, we're always, we're always being invited out there and sometimes we'll show up, you yeah. know, and uh, it's good to do. Do you yeah. think that the, that sense of community attracts a better type of tenant? Does it, does it make any kind of difference or do, is it just kind of a feel good thing that doesn't really add any value to your bottom line? Um, and meaning, you know, are you going to rent it faster because you've got uh, that community or anything else? I'm not sure if we read it faster, but I think people stay longer, and okay. so we have less turnover. And I've been really pleasantly surprised. We have below a 3% uh, vacancy out there in the apartments. Oh, wow. That's and great. And so for that kind of a complex to have that low of a vacancy factor, I think is attributed to that relationship that people have with one another. That's great. Do you have any good tips for finding that kind of manager that can handle that? And by anybody, I mean like finding like. Do you have any tips for me on how I <laughs> that manager? Always, what's in it for Brandon? And right? if if you can give me their phone number, I'll give them a call. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right, you live nearby. Yeah, don't do that. That would be a yeah, bad idea. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the irony is, my realtor told us to get rid of her when we bought the property. Really interesting. And and yet we communicated to her, talked with her, worked with her, and found that we were able to mold her and shape her, kind of the direction we wanted to go. And she was very well suited to the community. Uh, she was very well suited to that building and the structure. She had some leadership abilities that I don't think had been developed before, but she's risen in that. And, uh, you know, she's not the same person she was eight years ago uh, to the better. And yeah. so nice. our relationship with her has grown. We've done some things together. We sent her and her husband down to Disneyland after they had been there for five years as a big thank you. And so really kind of, doing some special things and some mile markers for her to acknowledge that and to build some loyalty uh, has really paid off for us. That's, That's cool. Do you, yeah. do you pay her just in free rent or do you guys give her money as well or how does that work? In that case, yeah, she gets a, a room plus a, a little cash bonus on top of that. Okay. Okay, nice. cool. Nice. Yeah, I, mean, I think no, it's not, not, a, not a bonus. It's a stipend. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's and she knows what that is every month, but then uh, we'll do bonus things from time to time. Yeah, that's very that's cool. Great. I, I yeah. love the I love the concept in theory of a resident manager. You know, I, but I've gone through three or four of them now, and and they all they're okay. And and really, what I what I think, especially after hearing you talk, like the words you use are like, you know, we molded her, we shaped her, we led her, we guided her. It's the same words that like Josh uses, right? As like the CEO of like you know, in developing a team. And, and I think that's where I've fallen short. And I've said that before. Is I'm I'm just not very good at managing people. And as a result, I don't mold them. I just, oh, they're not good enough. 
get a new one, you know, like <laughs> yeah. let them go. So actually this afternoon I have, uh, I'm having dinner with my resident manager to go to go over some training. So you're going to mold her. <laughs> it's a him, but yes, I'm going to oh, work on molding him. A there, little you bit, so. there you go. There you go. No, that's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. Hey, Kurt, I, I know I'd mentioned the negatives. I asked you what the downsides were. What are the upsides? What are the positives? And then we're going to really quickly wrap this segment up and move on to our, our next section here. Uh, positives to to the mixed, mixed use, use yeah, property, yeah, yeah. A, a diversity of income sources. I think would be the most obvious. And uh, when one thing isn't performing, the other is. And uh, so I, I think there's some flexibility with that, and it attracts people to that property. Hopefully, they complement one another. So I've got people upstairs in the uh, in the residence that come down to get their hair done, or they nice. come down to get their nails done at the nail shop, and. Yeah. And I've got an attorney in there, so it's one-stop shop. You know, you go get your nails done, get your hair done, get your will updated. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to have experience, you know, as, as a newbie, say some, you know, somebody decides, hey, you know what, this sounds interesting. I want to go buy my first multifamily, not my multi, uh, m- mixed, use. mixed use. And I found one and it's got a restaurant downstairs and apartments upstairs. Do I have to know about the restaurant business to get into that? Or do I have to generically kind of understand how to rent out a commercial property. What do I need to know to, to kind of get into this? Because I think there is a, yeah. somewhat of a transition from going from residential property to some of that uh, uh, commercial and retail. Yeah, I think there definitely is. I, I, I don't think you need to know about every business, but you need to have some people on your team that do. Okay. And so be that your realtor, your attorney, whoever that can look over that contract and say that's appropriate for this type of business. And, and there's some things with a restaurant, particularly as opposed to the attorney in a in an office where he doesn't use anything but a little bit of heat in, in the front door. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, there's definitely some things with liability, your insurance, utilities, all those kinds of things, common use, maintenance area, yeah. some of that kind of thing. Now, the other thing you got to know is uh, your percentage of commercial versus residential. And lenders are going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, you got too much commercial exposure. We don't want to lend to you. And so they're going to look at a percentage and you'll want to talk to your lenders to say, well, how much, wh- what's your typical percentage is probably an 80, 20 or something to that nature. They want mostly residential as opposed to commercial. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, would you recommend that newer investors uh, invest in mixed use or you would say, wait until you've got a little more experience? If you've got a good team behind you, you know, go for it. My personal preference is residential. And if I were, as I move forward, I'm not so sure I'm going to be looking for more mixed use or commercial. I know there's some other guys on the uh, on the forums that are all hyped up about it and they love it. And that's their wheelhouse. They understand it and yeah. they're going with it. But uh, that's not mine. Hey, re- really, really quickly, you had mentioned realtor, lawyer, other, other folks. And, and this is a broad generalization that's going to piss off a lot of realtors, but that's okay. Um, so generally, you know, I've, I've found that that residential real estate agents don't know anything about uh, investment property. Yeah. On the other hand, commercial agents tend to be far, 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 far more sophisticated. And so, you know, if you need somebody to lean on, I, I think yeah. turning to a, a local uh, commercial agent is probably going to be a really, really good bet. And and I think there's probably a lot less training that would need to be done than would be would need to be done on a residential agent. I concur fully. Yeah. 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 So, you know, folks, lean on those uh, local commercial guys because they can certainly help you out. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned your strategy is not necessarily to go to more commercial. Uh, what is your strategy? Like what, what does your future look like? Like I told you, I'm still growing, still learning. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, my future, I uh, anticipate, you know, this, this transition that should take place by the end of this year. The, it's its own acquisition in itself. Right now I'm in a 50-50 partnership. I'm going to take over both of these properties. I'm going to take over an additional 33 units that will be mine, zero down, and then a graduated payment structure. So, you know, a partnership buyout is another way to buy property, zero down. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I didn't put that in my book, <laughs> which you can get at biggerpockets.com. Oh, stop. No money. Oh, stop. I got to tell you, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at these two guys, and I'm thinking – what did I do wrong? I'm like, I'm sitting, I got two pastors eyeballing me the whole time here on Skype. I'm just, uh, I'm just a leader. Not a, you know, oh, something, I don't get the big P happened. word. All right. All right. All well, right. let's, let's move on, Kurt. We've got the next section of our show, which is. It's time for the fire round. All 
All right, the fire round. These questions come straight from the Bigger Pockets forums. So let me let me throw them at you. Uh, number one, if a landlord doesn't want to manage their own property, should they get a property management company? And I'll add to this, or should they like raise up a resident manager? I'll kind of tweet the question to be a little more fitting for this. Should they hire just a typical property management company or raise up their own? I'm assuming you've got uh, enough property to do that with and not a single family residence or a duplex. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, one works yeah. so well. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good assumption. Uh, yeah, so yeah, again, it's going to depend on your interests, abilities, and tolerances as to whether you're able to work with the individual who's doing it and oversee your your on-site manager, or if you are wanting to travel the rest of your life and leave it in the background and just collect a paycheck, and uh, depends on you know where where you're headed. So, uh, I think there's some advantages to both of those, and there's some downsides to both of them too. Great, great. Next question. When a renter pays a security deposit to a landlord, where does it go? I mean, does it all go into a single bank account or are there separate bank accounts for the, uh, for the rent checks and the security deposits? How is that kind of handled? Pizza fund. Yeah, there you Pizza go. Pizza Washington Pizza. state law requires us to put that in a trust account separate of our operating fund. Okay. Yeah. And I think most states are probably like that. Yeah. 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 And by the way, if they're not doing that, uh, happen to me, you know. Yeah, bad things can happen. Bad <laughs> things can happen. You don't want to spend that money and not have it available in the end. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I had a I had a property manager who was was commingling. Not only were they doing that, they were commingling funds of like all their people. Yeah, it was that was fun. Yeah, fun. that was fun. awesome. All right. All right. Uh number 3, how do you screen? How do you screen for good tenants? Oh, well, I, I meet my tenants. I talk to them on the phone. I meet them at the site. Uh, you sure I, you're asking the right guy that, that question? I mean, he did say he's got <laughs> prostitutes and drug lords living in his apartment unit. So I, I don't know. Maybe we should find a different question. <laughs> <laughs> They're not living there now. Oh, sometimes oh. they find friends and get influences uh, that uh, redirect that their lives. You know? so, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding, Kurt. Sometimes I do wonder what uh, if I'm screening, but uh, I, I use a professional agency to do that and currently I'm using the Washington Landlord Association to, okay. to process my um, my residents. Right nice. nice. And um, what, what do you look for? I'm just curious. Like, What, what are the red flags um, that you would say no, I will not rent to this person? Well, first of all, I want to know that you can pay your rent on time every time and I want to know secondly that you're going to take care of my property. Uh, so all the questions are going to revolve around that. They're going to come back down to those, those issues. How long have you been on your job? Is it a brand new job? Did you just move to town? And I just talked to a guy who just moved here from as far away as I can imagine. And, uh, he's ready to jump in tomorrow. And so, you know, if they're looking at something right now, right today, as quick as I can get there, <laughs> that's a red flag. And so I tend to put the brakes on them and say, Hey, well, it's going to take us a couple of days to process this. Yeah. And, uh, I let them know. You know, we're looking at your criminal history. We're looking at your rent history. We're looking at your income history. And uh, sometimes when I tell them that, they just decide not to call back. Yeah. yeah. What are yeah. the criminal things that uh, that that would give you red flags? I mean, do you, do you let any kind of criminals in, or or just you know just prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I tend to be a second chance kind of guy. But I'm not a third chance guy. Okay. And so uh, I have taken some people that others I'm sure wouldn't, uh, but it depends on the property that I'm putting them in as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you've got some assaults or you've got some uh, domestic issues, you're not going to fit into my complex. Yeah. Uh, if you've got some theft issues, that's not going to fit real well. Uh, some of the other issues, you know, I, I, I talk to people, I talk to them pretty straight. I had a guy that showed up and I knew that he had some issues and that's why he was talking with me. And then he shows up at 10 o'clock to see the place and I smell alcohol in his breath. And so I look him yeah. straight in the eye and I says, is this going to be a problem with us? <laughs> you know? yeah. And what, what are you doing to work with this, to deal with this? Are you going to meetings? Are you, you know, it is $1,100 a month unit. So, you know, I, I want to know that you're not going to trash my unit. I want to know you're not going to have big parties there. I want to know, um, you know, your income source and how long you've been there and, you know, some of those kind of things. Right on, right on. Yeah. Great. Well, final question here for the fire round is, do you use the same rental agreement for all of your properties? Yes. Okay. Right. Fair enough. Even, even commercial ones? I'm oh, assuming well, that would be different, oh, well, right? Yeah, that, that, that is different, but all the, all the residentials are the same. Perfect. Okay. 
Okay. Cool. cool. Now, right in, in fairness, some of the rule sheets are a little different. Uh, out in Shelton at the mixed use, you know, dorm style housing, it's a little bit different than it is, you know, in the other complex. Gotcha. Sure. Cool. Fair enough. No fraternizing in the uh, common areas. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No smoking in the building. Uh, yeah. Of course, we have no smoking anywhere in our buildings, but uh, it, it's a bigger issue there. Yeah. Gotcha. Right on. Cool. Cool. All right. Moving on to the end of the show, the segment that we were going to call our famous four. All right. The famous four. Uh, we ask everyone these questions and uh, let's see what you got to say. Number one, what is your favorite real estate book? Favorite's a tough word. It's usually the one I'm reading. <laughs> nice. Uh, yep. But I've benefited from a lot of them that I've read. And, you know, I would say the Rich Dad series, particularly McElroy's Advanced Guide to Real Estate, yeah. uh, Millionaire Real Estate Investor with Keller, and the one I mentioned earlier, uh, Mark McKenzie's Marketopoly was written right after, well, I think it was 2007, and it really dealt with some of the downturn and how to make money in that and how to evaluate properties. He did a good job of that. Oh, right uh, on. But let me throw one out just for landlords especially, and, and if you just want a couple hours of some humor and practical insight, a little bit of a cynical edge, uh, The Care and Feeding of Tenants by oh, Andy Kane. Never heard of and, it. Mm-mm. Oh, it, it's a bit of a kick. Uh, <laughs> s- uh, seasoned landlords are going to really enjoy it. They're going to identify it. New guys are going to certainly learn from it as well. Oh, cool. great. That's great. That's yeah, great. That's I, excellent. Yeah, yeah. All right. What's your favorite business book? I like Drucker, Peter Drucker, uh, the effective executive, you know, getting things done in the right, the right things at the right time. But uh, more recently, uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, uh, Thou my shalt type of guy. prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Ten Commandments for Making Money. And, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we're in a strange, you know, anti-capitalist climate, it seems. And he really gives us permission to be successful. Nice. Shows us the moral imperative of being ethically uh, successful and how that translates to benefit not just you, but society and uh, the community in, in general. Oh, that's cool. That sounds really good. Yeah, you know, it, it, that's a pet peeve of mine. You know, this anti-capitalistic thing that's happening in our society <laughs> these days. I mean... I don't know. It's always the guys who are sitting there on wads of cash that are bitching and moaning about how bad it is. <laughs> so, you know, what are you going to say about it? <laughs> what do you All do? right. Hobbies. What do you do for fun? Oh, we have a lot of interest around my house. We love to travel. You know, my home is fairly simple because we like to go other places and spend our money doing things and making memories. So that, nice. that's a big thing. Um, uh, I, my boys and I took up scuba diving. Uh, we do have done Puget Sound, but we really enjoy going to the warmer climates. Nice. And yeah, I don't so, uh, we, we like that. So dining out, traveling, both stateside and, and internationally. Oh, right on. Cool. Real cool. passion. Sounds All right. Like fun. My final question of the day. What do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from those who uh, either give up, fail, or never get started in the first place? Yeah, I think people who bring value to the market succeed. And so I, I think it's kind of key to find ways to serve other people. And no, here comes my ministerial hat, you oh. know, <laughs> uh, a paraphrase Jesus discussion with his disciples. And they were wanting to know who's going to be the top dog. And Jesus basically said, if you want to be great, be the servant of all. And so I say, whatever you're doing, find a way to meet the needs of others, find ways to benefit others and make a win-win situation out of it. And that brings a lot more benefit than the, you know, a one-time shakedown. Yeah, right on, right on. I think that's great. And even for those of us who uh, uh, are, do not ascribe to uh, the <laughs> J-Man, I think, I think we all w- w- could agree to that. I mean, you know, just be, be good to other folks. And I think it kind of pays itself back. Yeah. So that's okay. awesome. Well, Kurt, it's, this has been fun. It's been fun, yeah. you know, except for the part where you eyeball me and make me feel <laughs> guilty. But uh, that has been a lot of fun, and, and we definitely appreciate having you on board and sharing your wisdom. And we love that you're part of Bigger Pockets community. Uh, where can people find out more information about you? I'm assuming, obviously, on the site. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm on the site, and uh, you know, y- you can uh, message me there and connect. Connected with a fellow this morning, had a great time together, and so uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be there and, and what you got going on it. That was the fellow that you had breakfast with who you decided you weren't going to partner with. So maybe you <laughs> <Yeah>. shouldn't message him. <laughs> hey, but we're going to be in touch and we're going to, you know, bounce ideas back and forth and some deals and uh, hopefully we'll we'll both glean from that. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, listen, thanks again. Really, really, we do appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much. 
All right, guys, this is show 95 of the Bigger Pockets podcast with Kurt Bidwell. We really do appreciate his time and energy. You can find the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 95. If you are not already an active member of Bigger Pockets, we definitely encourage you to jump on the site at www.biggerpockets.com, create a profile, engage, connect with your peers, get involved. Follow us on our other social media, Facebook, Twitter, G+, LinkedIn, YouTube, and uh, you know, get out there, do things, do it the right way, be moral, be ethical. Teach your kids. Teach your kids how to do this stuff. Get them excited about business and, and about you know, uh, entrepreneurship. I, I think that's just really, really important. And that's it. Make things happen, guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I'm Josh Dorkin, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.